how are you? I hope you're well. I'm sorry I can't be there on level one. I was looking forward to speaking about the Aurora concert, but of course, none of us can be there. Instead, I'm here in my sitting room in Bristol, and I thought I'd share some thoughts on creative listening, or let's call it lockdown listening. And I've compiled for you eight tips on how to engage with the music at a deeper level and and really get the most out of our listening experience. So I have this image of you, I don't know if it's correct, just hunkering down now during lockdown with a, I don't know, a a symphonic-sized mug of tea and listening to a box set of Bruckner, or perhaps it's the back catalogue of the Beatles, or whatever it is, you're making the most of this time to really dig into your listening experience. If you are doing that, then you're in the minority, ladies and gentlemen, because I actually read a statistic recently that said that 80% of us, when we listen to music online, skip onto the next track after just a minute's listening. And sometimes it's a lot under that, just a minute. So with this oversaturation, I suppose, of listening opportunities, we're too easily distracted And I have to admit, I'm a bit of a paddler across the waters of listening recently as well. I don't know if you found the same. Um, It's it's all too easy, isn't it, to skip a movement or just take a rather superficial approach to our listening. So these eight tips are as much for me as they are for anybody who's watching. Back in the 50s, Aaron Copeland, the composer, said this. The modern listener uses music as a couch. They want to be pillowed in it. I I love that, pillowed in it. Relaxed from the stress of daily living. And you might say, well, what's so wrong with that? And actually, of course, it's, it's great just to have music waft over us and to be relaxed by it. But let's take the opportunity now to go deeper than that. So what is creative listening? Is there such a thing? Well, there is, and it goes by various different names. You could call it active listening or purposive listening. Anything that connotes focusing in and not just hearing the sound, but really engaging with it and asking the how questions. How is the creator, whether it's the composer or the songwriter, creating that sound? Or how are the performers interpreting it? Or how is it that I'm feeling this way? You know, those kind of deeper interrogatives are important. So creativity in general has been an area of research that has grown hugely over the last 50 years. And there's a consensus that for a creative thought or a creative product, you have to have three things. One, it needs to be new. Two, it needs to be surprising. And three, it needs to have some kind of value. Now, that's all relative, isn't it? It could be new to you, surprising to you, or it could be new and surprising to society at large, or even globally. It doesn't matter. For it to be creative, you've got to be disrupting your habitual way of thinking and surprising yourself with what you find. Um, And for it to have value, that's an interesting word, It's got to have some kind of weight, hasn't it, for you personally, at the very least. So something that you remember about the recording, something that you hear afresh and and really sort of think twice about. So if you've got those three things, it's new, it's surprising, it's valuable, then that defines creative listening in the broadest sense. So I think the first thing we have to do is to create the right environment. And I really think there's a parallel here between seeing a flickering flame on a candle, and bear with me, I know this is a bit of a tired uh, analogy, but anyway, a flickering flame of a candle is so much brighter, isn't it, when you put the lights off and you can see it strong there in the darkness. And I think that is akin to listening to something like the fugue in Mozart's 41st Symphony, It's almost as if when we listen to that, normally we've got neon bright lights on. We can't see that small little flickering flame. So we need to be in the equivalent of the dark in order to really focus in on the music. 
So you need something like a do not disturb sign, whether literal or otherwise. You need to be tucking yourself down with the headphones and giving yourself that space to really listen in. Obviously, turn off all screens, turn off all mobile phones and, and put away distractions for a while. So that is the first tip, is to attend to our listening environment and have the equivalent of a darkened room so we can see that candle flame. Number two, I think it's important to think like the composer. So that means you might have to press pause. Have you ever tried doing that? Instead of listening to vast tracks of music at a time, you can press pause. Let's try that right now. I've got here a rather famous piece of music for you. I'm sure you'll recognise it. It's by a certain Ludwig van Beethoven. I'm going to flash you the cover there. A gold label. Did you see Herbert von Karajan there? So you probably know roughly what I'm dealing with here. But here we go. Here we go, here we go. The biggest held breath in the history of classical music so far. That was Ludwig van Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the finale. And there the entire choir has been standing before God, for God. You have that dramatic chord. Now, what would you do next? Personally, I would want, after all that momentum, to have... What would you do? We've pressed pause. Well, what does Beethoven do? You might well know. There's a little twitch there in the contrabassoon. Roger Norrington famously called it a fart. Just twitching away. And then this very sprightly little Turkish march breaks out. Completely unexpected. Even now, as I listen to it, I think, really? It's, where did you get that idea from? You've gone from the sublime, in a way, to the ridiculous. But that was part of Beethoven's point, uh, embracing humanity with the sym symphony. So... Um, Let's do another thing. Shall I? I'll do another example. You know, I like pressing pause on music, and I think we should be doing that more often. It really sort of tests our ear and invites us to just think of uh, being actively involved in the creative process of making the music. So this is uh, a piano trio by Beethoven again. Why not? His early one in G major, opus one, number two, and the finale. Piano has the tune now, we're just dancing along. Guess what? The cello has the tune. You know, it's a trio, so they all have the tune. Fair enough. Do you know this one? It's brilliant, isn't it? So the piano is showing off a little bit now. You can imagine Beethoven playing this. A little bit of dialogue in the violin and cello. Now, what's going to happen here? I've just pressed pause. I'm thinking like Beethoven. What would you do? Well, let's see what Beethoven does. So a sort of a tremolando in the piano, a lot of tension there. And a sort of three blind mice in the, in the cello. Did you hear that? Really short. And the like that, like a little scared mouse scurrying away. So we're in the minor key. Complete opposite, isn't it, of what we had. It was scurrying along really quite joyously, and now we've gone to the dark side. So, press pause a little bit more. Set up the right environment, press pause. Three, how often do you think of smell or the taste or touch of a piece of music? Are you into the multi-sensory ways of describing a piece of music. If you do, then you're sort of pushing into the peripheries of the vocabulary for describing. We're not just relying on the usual ways of defining the sound. 
to ourselves, but we're forcing ourselves to associate other senses with that experience. And I think that forces us, again, to disrupt our normal habits and to listen in a new way. So again, let's give this a go. I think Ravel's music is very good to the touch. Let's just see if you agree. This is his sonatine. What are you seeing? What are you sensing under the fingers? What, what does it smell like? so sumptuous that isn't it for me i see uh, gossamer veils just billowing in the wind or perhaps something being chased through cool waters you know um, and it smells of chamomile it's a dainty perfume uh, i might be being weird here but you know meet me halfway you know what i'm trying to do here is just opening up our senses and hearing sound fresh and it will it will stay with you all the more that way. I was teaching about Britain recently to my pre-conservative art students and I put it to them that his music is rather like hot water with lemon in, so very fresh and tart and angular in its way, uh, but also with a teaspoon of honey to sweeten it because we have that tonality, we have that sense of home as well that goes alongside the lemon. Um, I've just realised I'm halfway towards a hot toddy, but you know, I don't think whiskey belongs to the Britain sound. You might contend that. Anyway, let's see if we can open our senses. Now the fourth idea, and you might have noticed I was doing this all the time, is I tend to conduct along to the music. Old habits die hard. I was and am a conductor, but I think we should all find our inner maestro when we listen. So I want to see you sort of moving around to the music. And it doesn't have to be the precise beating patterns or anything like that, but just describing the general arches and gestures of what you're hearing. So let's just try that with the opening to Brahms' Fourth Symphony, for example. It's uh, a good one because it ebbs and flows. Let's just try this. And just conduct along with me. Again and again. Big sweet though. Now the surge. Bigger. And little ebbings. Forwards. Do you get the drift? I mean, I could go on for ages doing that, and I hope you could too. We're sort of a half a step towards a dance response, aren't we, to the music? So you can do this in the privacy of your own home. At the very least, stand up when you listen to the music. Walk around. Just start moving and, and, and closing your eyes and just seeing how the music plays with your body in that way. It, it really will feel, I suppose, less odd and more natural the more you do it. So thought number five is we should repeat sections. Now, I, I'm thinking about the equivalent of when we behold a wonderful masterwork of art, a lovely painting, say, of Rembrandt. I'm thinking of the return of the prodigal son. You know that one. You have the prodigal son knelt there before the father. Now, would you... If you saw the Rembrandt in a gallery, would you just go, oh, that's nice, and walk on? No, but we're stuck in a way with doing that in music because it is so ephemeral. We're stuck with the chronology of the art form. And so, of course, with a recording, we can get beyond that and we can go back to re-examine what we've just heard. And I certainly do, don't do enough of that, I think. So, you know, with the painting, it's only once you stand there for several minutes that you get drawn in to the detail of the hand of the father on the prodigal son's back or the disapproving look of the elder son or whatever it is that's going on in the background as well. 
And we need to do the equivalent of that when we listen. So you might want to pause, rewind, and really take in the music two or three times. And this, of course, is even truer of newer pieces, less familiar pieces, and contemporary pieces that feel slightly alien on our ears. So repeat the listening in quick succession. For those of you who can, and this is my sixth point, try and listen with a score. And even if you can't read music that well, you'll see in the score all sorts of really useful detail. Uh, it could be the markings, um, it could be which instruments are being used, the general dynamics, and you can follow the general shape of the texture and see how the composer is using the instruments in creative ways. It really does open up a huge new level and it goes without saying really that uh, I suppose if you're listening to a dialogue, uh, again in a foreign language perhaps, uh, Portuguese and you only know Spanish, you might lock on to a few words here and there. But it's not until you see the transcript of that dialogue that you're able to actually piece things together. And again, it, it stays with you. And I think actually just with that metaphor, a lot of what we're doing here with creative lesson, uh, listening is akin to watching a foreign film, normally without the subtitles. Okay, so you can normally just, I don't know, tell a lot about the narrative from the action. But it's not until the subtitles are there that we can really engage with it in any meaningful depth. So that is what creative listening is about. See, I'm just overflowing with uh, foreign language metaphors here. Anyway, bear with me. Seventh point. We could do what the music therapists do, which is invite a, an artistic response, a graphic response to the music. Now, I did this um, actually in the hallowed halls of Harvard some years ago now. And we put out these massive A3 blank pieces of paper with mugs of felt tip pens in front of very brainy Harvard professors and asked them just to free flow across the page as they listened to the music. And you can imagine the resistance they demonstrated and clearly felt to the task. They felt somehow infantilized by the task. But do you know what? Every single one of them loved doing it. And it was that task that stayed with them beyond the day. So let's try that ourselves. Let's try just getting out the colours and responding to the emotional intensity of the music, to the shapes of what you're hearing in the sound, and to the instrumental colour as much as anything else. And just representing that in your own way. And yes, put it up on the fridge afterwards. Be proud, you know. It's all of value. My eighth... And final point, I hope you're still with me at this stage. My eighth and final point is to keep a journal of what you're listening to. And that's a way of marking the value of the exercise, isn't it? If you're spending an extra five minutes just marking down your novel and surprising thoughts about the piece of music, then that's according it value. And of course it makes it more memorable that way. You can look back and see, ah, yeah, yeah. And you begin to trace the red thread through your listening experiences and it opens up another depth of listening beyond. So I suppose the good news is, is that if we're always challenging ourselves in that way to listen out for something that's new and surprising to us, and that has some kind of value in opening our ears to something new, then, it gets easier, you know, we get used, our ears can be trained, our inner ear can be trained to listening in a new way. And it should, I think, feel like effort. You know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to make something that is so abstract as sound feel concrete and start putting words on it. I know because I try to do this very often in my life and it is hard, it takes effort. But it's so worth it. And I think that's a, a general truism about creative acts, exercises of, of, of any kind. You know, whether it's listening or composing or improvising, or whatever it is. The more we challenge ourselves to be creative, the more fun and rewarding it is. And so I wish you, in this lockdown period, very happy listening. <laughs>